Glory to God. You know, that song is just so, so beautiful. It's, um, it just is as if it takes, takes you into the heavens. It also makes me think of uh, Nana Maskuri singing Amazing Grace. Just absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I love that um, the song a hundred billion times where we just think, if you just think of the whole plan that God had with man, it all rests in the hands of God. It, it does not rest in our hands. It is all the hands of God. It's all that he, it is his plan from the beginning to the end. He brought us forth. He is the one that says, I will bring it forth in you, I will complete the work that I've started. If we look at how Genesis started, it was all about God promising man eternal life. He offered him the tree of life. He told him not to stand by the power of his own ability, to trust and rely upon him, that he will bring it forth. There's no unclear message from the beginning that it is only by faith. It has never been about works. Never. It has never been by works. The only time when works came in was by man's own decision. It was man deciding that it will be by works. God never made it by works even for a short period of time. The law was not even given so that man could be saved by works. The law was given so that man could see it's not by works and that it is only by God bringing forth his will in man by his power, the power of his ability to bring forth and create, to create in us a clean heart, to create in us eternal life. That we see in Ephesians chapter 2, um, Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to just read it again there quickly. Um, Ephesians 1. This is so, so, so powerful. It says here, Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us unto the adoption of sonships through Jesus Christ in accordance to the pleasure of his will. So from before the world was made, God has decided that through a Messiah, through a man that would bring forth who God is in us, he would bring us unto him. So the definition of a Messiah has never been that of a political leader that's going to conquer the systems of this world. A, a Messiah has always been, the definition of Messiah to God, has always been one that brings forth the fullness of God in us bodily. That is why we, we could uh, expect a Messiah from the beginning. That is why the message to Adam has been that of a Messiah, one that would bring forth the fullness of God in man bodily, which is the tree of life, which is what we should believe and trust in. So it has never been about works. It will never be about works. It has never even been about works under the law. The law was simply given for one reason, and that was when the Jews thought that it was about their special flesh or because they are Jews that God showed them, it is not about your works, and it is about grace. So the gospel has been preached through ages and generations, even unto the Jews, to the point that the Bible says, and we're going to look at that in Romans chapter 10 today, that the Jews clearly heard the gospel, that they had messengers that did come to them, that the Old Testament was clearly teaching the grace of God, but that they did not want to have it about grace. They didn't want to have it about their, uh, uh, about the work of God, but they wanted to be about themselves, about their own works. And we find that that pattern, sadly, is repeated in people even today, where they wanted to be about their works. But I've got good news for you today. It is never going to be 
about the works. doesn't matter if 8 billion people agree together and say it is going to be about what we must bring forth, where righteousness will be about what we do, and it will be established in our own works. It doesn't matter if that is what we think it is going to be or what humanity agrees upon that it will end up to be. It is never going to be about that. It is what God has decided from before the world was, what he decided in himself, and that is that he would graciously give us eternal life. And as he spoke, and the earth was created, as he spoke, and animals came into life, as he spoke, and we came into existence, he even when we failed, as the song so beautifully says, He spoke and a hundred billion failures just disappeared. And the word of eternal life became flesh and dwells in humanity at the right hand of God. And that is a word for us. Glory to God. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? Now, today we're going to go to Romans chapter 10. And as I go to Romans chapter 10... I cannot but be mindful of uh, Philippians 3. Philippians 3, Paul says, I don't find it difficult to repeat myself because I know this is for your benefit. Because this world is so full of different ways of doing and different systems that want to get our minds into a belief that we need to raise up our own righteousness. This system of own righteousness is not just a system which we look at biblically. In other words, the law and the systems of the world and all of that. But it is also uh, basically woven into this normal political world wherein we think that if we can just have a good enough law system, uh, a good enough system in this world, then we will, uh, if we have good enough laws, good enough judges, good enough police, good enough of all of these things, then we will see the kingdom of God in this world. That is what we will see. And we get so easily confused, should we take Romans 13, where it talks about authorities and that we should submit to authorities and that authority is of God. Um and that we should have respect for authority and pay our taxes and give honor where honor is due and so forth. We so easily misunderstand that passage, and we think that through these authorities and through these authorities being right and correct and um, good, it will create a platform for righteousness. And we would even say that Through these authorities, righteousness will prevail. Righteousness will stand. It just brings so much confusion if we think that way. So I'm going to look at uh, Romans chapter 10. I'm going to look at what it is um, to have the righteousness of God and how Paul basically corrects his own people because they try to build up their own righteousness from the works of the law. Okay, this is Romans 10 and verse 1. It says, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Okay, so... These Jews, think now for yourself, did they have knowledge about God? Well, they had knowledge about the law. They had knowledge about, uh, I mean, all the laws and how God created the heavens and the earth and all those kind of things. We as, um, I don't like to use these words, but I speak in a fleshly manner. But we as Gentiles, we as Gentiles, We so many times think that the Jews are in some way superior to us in knowledge because they have knowledge about the covenants 
They have knowledge about the Old Testament. They have knowledge about Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew language. They have knowledge about the traditions and the feasts and all these kind of things. They have knowledge about that. And it's as if uh, they just know a little bit more than us. But here Paul comes and he says that these people are very zealous for God, but not according to knowledge meaning they don't have knowledge. They know about the feasts and they know about all these things, but they don't have the knowledge of God. They don't have the knowledge on how salvation works. They don't know. Now, I want to just say this. I'm not saying this in pointing fingers to the Jews at all. I, um, if, if their rejection of the gospel had the salvation of us as a result, would their acceptance of the gospel not mean that they would also receive salvation? Yes, when they accept the accept the gospel, they will also be saved. So this is not pointing the finger, but what I'm trying to say here is, in our systems of this world, we so quickly get tricked into thinking that if we can just get the ANC government right, if we can just get some of these laws to change, if we can just get less corruption in the police, if we can just get people not to abuse funds, if we can get the government not to steal funds and then tax us more and all those kind of things, if we can just get that sorted out, then we will find the peaceful kingdom of God in the earth. The I want to tell you that that is a lie. If we think that way, we do have maybe a zeal to see the kingdom of God in the earth, but not according to knowledge. It is according to the knowledge of the systems of this world, which would be defined by Paul as ignorance, ignoring God's logic on how to get life into this world. Now, I spoke to a good friend of mine, um, and he said to me that he basically just veered away from the news now for more than a month. He didn't watch any of the news. And he said that he lives a very peaceful life, and he doesn't know any of the things that's going on in the news media. And should he have known, he, he wouldn't have been able to really change a lot of those things because he's just like one man, you know, sitting in a small town here in the Western Cape. How would he now make a difference? He can maybe post three or four things and just be tortured by the thoughts of the destruction that is coming. But in the meantime, what he's done is he's just put his mind on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that has really blessed him and helped him in difficult times, since he's also going through other difficult time, difficult things in his life. So what I try to say here is that we can live according to the knowledge of God or we can live in ignorance being very knowledgeable about things that is actually ignoring the salvation that God has brought, which is not a works system but a grace system. Once you've looked at every avenue that would lead unto salvation, Church, um, the answer at the end of the day is going to be God being gracious to man and we just believing and relying upon him wherein we in our flesh come to the, con uh, the conclusion as what Abraham did which said that in my flesh I can only conclude that it's already dead and that no fruit can come forth. The moment we've come to the realization that through government or through any system of this world, doesn't matter how hard we try, the end result is that we will not have any fruit unto life or any fruit unto righteousness whatsoever, but that we would only have to rely upon the living God. The quicker we get to that, the quicker we will start to see fruit in our lives. We will find that the, what happens in this world will not torture you anymore. You will have peace. You will have peace. You will, you will be protected against being politicized by the systems of this world, which 
could really have a zeal for righteousness, truly a zeal for righteousness. But the zeal they have, the passion they have, is not according to knowledge. Now, let us read from verse 3. It says, Since they did not know the righteousness of God, they sought to establish their own righteousness. In trying to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Okay. That is a very, very powerful passage that Paul has just uh, penned down there. He's, it is just amazing what he's saying. Now, let me get to that again and just go to verse 3 because I don't want us to, lead, to uh, miss the flow of thought here. What Paul is saying is he's saying that the Israelites, the people of God, the people that knew God, that understood the law, that had the best set of rules and laws to govern by. Listen, the best set of rules to govern by is not our democratic systems. The best rules and laws to govern by is the Old Testament law that was written down in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, all those things. That, that is the best set. We can try and redevelop and do whatever we want. Um, the best set was that set, and that set fell short far. We can even today see shortcomings in that system. And if righteousness or if life could have been by the law, it would have been by the law that was given to the Jews. And there was none by that leading us to the place where we, even in our nation, in our school systems, in everything, can only come to one conclusion. And that is that while we live in this world now, we can only rely and believe upon God. We have the systems whereby we walk in this earth, the government systems, and there's nothing we can do against it. We cannot, the Bible says, submit to it. We just submit to it. But our trust is in God. Our trust is not in any of those systems at all. We don't define righteousness that way. So with that said, Paul comes and he says that as we walk according to the systems of this world, we are ignorant of God's righteousness. Now, the word righteousness there, according to the, um, the treasure of scriptural knowledge, it's a cross-reference that gives a little bit of... Uh, definitions of words as well, they say that that word righteousness there means God's way of saving. It is God's way of saving. So the treasure, the, 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 the treasury of scriptural knowledge defines the word righteousness there as God's way of saving. So what they are saying is they wanted to establish their own way wherein they thought salvation would come forth, but they were ignorant on how God saves. They were ignorant on how God brings salvation. So ignorance on how God brings salvation would lead you to want to bring forth salvation in your own works. This is something we do with our children. It's something we do in our own life. We think if our kids can just, you know, study the best courses, if they just do this, if they just do that. And we have the system whereby we think things are going to work out. And we want to save ourselves from poverty. We want to save ourselves. Uh, and we want to save ourselves from poverty because we think that if we save ourselves from poverty, we're going to save ourselves from depression. And we're going to save ourselves from hardship. And we're going to save ourselves from so many things if we save ourselves from poverty. And the way where we then think we're going to save ourselves from poverty is by, you know, having all these uh, systems in place. The other day I looked at um, a person that went to people at a hotel somewhere in Dubai. And it was just a hotel for the riches of the rich that now at this hotel, they bought their new cars. I don't know how it works, but they have got all these very fancy cars that's over like $500,000 and more. And uh, people come and then they buy these cars there. 
And then they asked the one lady, so what do you do for a living that you could afford a car like this? And she said, well, I left school when I was in grade seven. Now, she said, because we couldn't afford school and I didn't ever study. But eventually I started business. And I don't know what she does, if it's a modeling agency or whatever she has, but she made a lot of money. Now, just in something like money, which cannot even save us, money cannot save us from being depressed, money cannot save us from uh, cancer, money cannot save us from death, you know, but just as pertaining to money, we find that the systems of this world does not always produce as we think. But so many times we are tempted to fall into the systems of this world and we want to work up our own righteousness wherein we can be sure that we will be saved from poverty and we will be saved from these things instead of just relying upon God and God bringing forth in our way, our job, a desire in us on where to study, what to do, if I should study or not, um, if I must just start a business or not, or just work for a boss, whatever it is. We're so easily tempted to fall into that works righteousness thing. But here Paul says that if we are ignorant of how God saves, we will fall into these things. Listen to what Moses says. Moses writes about the righteousness that is by, by the law. The person who does these things will have life by them. The righteousness of the law is to say that if we do these things, we're going to have life. Now, I do believe that in this world, there are just certain things that if you just do, do it, it would be better for you. Don't just be rude and shout at everybody. You know, drive according to the uh, speed limits and stop at the stop street, pay your tax, do whatever you need to do, and you'll find a certain amount of peace in this world. But it is never going to be producing true life and inner peace, ever. It's never going to do it. So the law system is this. You've got rules that you say, if I do these things, then by doing these things, I shall live. And that is the logic that the Jews follow. And that is the logic that we are tempted with every day. Every day, when you put the television on, that's what you're tempted with. When you watch that uh, WhatsApp video that your friend has sent you, that is what. If you watch the, the latest thing that was said by Cyril Ramaphosa or by Malema or by um, Stian Hazen or whoever, when you watch that, when you watch the, uh, the budget speech, when you get that, you are facing the logic of if these things would be this way, this way, this way, and you've got your certain steps, then we will have life. We are tempted with that. So many times, times as Christians, we think, well, we, there must be a separation between what happens in government and Christianity. So yes, while we are on the earth, we must invest our lives in the one system, the earthly system, as well as as pertaining to the spiritual things, we invest our lives and our hearts in the kingdom of God. Now, if you do that, and I don't say you cannot do that, I can just tell you this is how it's going to work. You're going to be double-minded, and you're going to be unstable in all your ways. You're going to find that you live in turmoil one moment of the day, and then on a Sunday, when you listen to a message like what I'm preaching now, you're going to feel better. You're going to feel encouraged. You're going to feel, oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, I feel a bit better now. Yes, thank you, Lord. It's about you. I'm going to heaven. Uh, I, I know you are with me, and I know that I will be part of the resurrection. I thank you. You don't look at my sins and everything. And then about five o'clock, you know, or in the morning, on Monday morning, you just think of the things of the world. You drive on your way uh, to school and dropping off the kids. You see a taxi driver that doesn't drive the way he's supposed to and you listen to something on the news and then you are all of a sudden quickly switching from one reality to another reality and should you think that that is how it's supposed to be from and it's from God, you're going to be in turmoil every day, every day because you are living in this world not according to true knowledge. Now, 
Let me go to um, Hosea. I want to go to uh, Hosea. And I'm going to read from Hosea chapter 4. Listen to what it says here. Remember the scripture that says, My people perish because of a lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. In this week in the daily devotional, I sent a message out as pertaining to this. I think I, I, I did it a little bit better in the English than in the Afrikaans for those that watch the Afrikaans. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this because the knowledge that we're supposed to have in this world is about God. And as we have knowledge about God and who we are and we reflect to that and we live from that reality, you will find that even peace will come forth in this world from God, not from you. It says here, hear the word of the Lord, you Israel, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying, and murder, stealing and adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land dries up, and all who live in, the wa in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea are swept away. So what he's basically saying is, is that there's no knowledge of God. There's no knowledge of God. People live in ignorance about God. And therefore, we find that there's bloodshed and fighting and all these kind of things in the world. And it even says that nature itself suffers under it. But let no one... Now listen to this. This is the key passage. But let no one bring a charge. Let no one accuse one another. For your people are like those who bring charges against priests. You stumble day and night, and the prophets stumble with you. So I will destroy your mother. Now, okay, let me explain this. This sounds very harsh from God. But listen to what he's saying. He says, This earth and what's going on in the world is because there's no honoring of God. There's no honoring of God. I'm going to also explain what honoring of God means. He says this world goes through what it goes through because it's basically a lack of knowledge. He says now, don't accuse one another. Don't say, no, it is you bringing this harm. No, it is you bringing this harm. We find that in politics all the time. The one person says, you know, it's this ANC government that's bringing this. No, 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 man. It is the old apartheid system that brought this. We are here because of the apartheid. That is why we are here. No, it is because of the Democrats. No, it's because of the Republicans. And we start to accuse one another. Listen to what he's saying here. He says, don't accuse one another when you see these things. He says, the destruction that comes, he says, my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. It says, because you have rejected knowledge, that's why you're experiencing rejection of life. That's why life is not there, because you've rejected knowledge. Now, what is the knowledge that we have rejected? Now, I say we. I'm talking about Israel in this context, and that what the world in general does. What is the knowledge that they reject? They are ignorant of the righteousness of God. They are ignorant of how God saves. And how God saves is not by works, but by raising a man from the dead, placing this man as Lord at the right hand of God, and then he rules over people. Because the world is ignorant of this, that is why there's so much destruction. And we can find we as a church fighting all the time for bringing in Old Testament laws into the government systems, fighting for the Ten Commandments to be on the walls of schools and parliament and all those kind of things, sharing in the very ignorance of those that don't believe in God. Because we are ignorant on how God saves. The way God saves is this way. He promises it. He gives it for free, 
and he brings it forth by his Holy Spirit through or in those who believe and rely upon and have the hope of bodily resurrection in the return of Jesus Christ. That is so much contrary to the systems of this world. But that is the truth. I mean, we can fight and we can try our best to bring forth the righteousness of God in this earth through the systems of this world. We will just end up where the Jews end up. Very passionate and a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. That is the problem. Destroying ourselves all the time. Not submitting ourselves to the righteousness of God. Not submitting ourselves to what he freely gives us and brings forth in us. Many might say, ach, but Bafti, and you know, even as I preach this, and I, I want to acknowledge to you that I am as much having a normal mind as what most of you would have. As you preach this, one would say, Ah, go and try and explain that. Go, go, you now go and try and explain this thing to Parliament. You now go and try and explain this to the, the board at the school or the town council. You go and try and explain this to the county and, and see if they can they understand this or would ever live according to this. People never going to live according to this. So let us put that aside and then see what's the best we can do with the systems of this world. Now, if that is how you want to reason, it is good as long as what you just keep it to that level, meaning, listen, I can only put as much effort in towards the systems of this world as what I know that it will result to not experiencing true life. True life can only be experienced by experiencing the resurrection power of Jesus Christ as you believe and rely upon him. Listen to this passage now again, verse 3. Since they did not know the righteousness of God or God's way of saving and sought to establish their own way of bringing forth life, salvation. In establishing their own way, they did not, they did not submit themselves to how God saves. Christ is the end goal of the law. So there may be righteousness or God's way of saving to everyone who believes. Can you imagine that God can bring salvation to a nation when they believe, and we will see what they need to believe, they believe that Jesus is Lord and that he was raised from the dead. If you believe that, if people believe that and have the voice of salvation, the message that we shall be saved from mortality, have eternal life by this Jesus. That can save a nation. That can save a nation. Somebody will say, but that will not end corruption. If that, I want to tell you that will bring, uh, uh, it, it will make things much better in this world if people truly believe that and what it implies will make this world much better and we will see perfection in the, in the day of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying this to try and change political views or I'm not saying this to even tell governments what they must do. I'm, telling, I'm saying this so that you today can live in peace when you hear negative reports. What I'm doing is I'm taking the true gospel of Jesus Christ and just putting it down in everyday life on making it real in everyday life, how I apply it in everyday life and how we can make use of this in everyday life. I'm going to go on to verse 6, and this is so beautiful, referring to, uh, I think, Leviticus, no, Deuteronomy, referring to Deuteronomy. It says here, The righteousness of Moses, or of the law, says, the one who does these things will live by them. We say it so many times. If the government can only do this, and if these people can only do that, if they can just stop to be corrupt, if they can just stop that, if we can, but we find ourselves not even being able, after we've said that, when we drive to our, to back home where, from our friend where we've confessed this and said this and des described our plan, we find that we cannot even keep to the traffic laws ourselves. 
disqualifying ourselves from a very system that we try to bring forth. It says, but the righteousness which is of faith says it this way. Now listen to this. This is so powerful. I tell you, Paul, and the way he was writing here, he was writing in a way where the very next yes, but that would come up in your mind is addressed by the next verse. That is how he writes. Because we would say, well, yes, but, you know, Bertie, it sounds as salvation is put so far from us. Because now, how are we going to get the world to believe? It's such a difficult thing. Listen to what verse 6 says. But the righteousness that is of faith says it this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring the Christ down? Or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring the Christ from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. Now, we have to go and look at the cross-reference in Deuteronomy there. It, it, this is in Deuteronomy uh, 30, verse 14. So Paul comes and he says, listen, you might now say it sounds very difficult to get salvation to come to us. It's very far from us. We've tried our best. We're not getting it done. Now you're even telling us that we are not even having the knowledge of God. So who will now go up into the heavens to bring us the knowledge of God? They're talking about Moses. Moses went up onto the mountain, went into the heavens. That is to bring the message of salvation down. down. Then he basically says, who will go into the deep? The deep was also called the ocean. Who will go to the other sides of the ocean to bring us a message on what we need to do to have salvation? It says here, now, what I'm commanding you today is not difficult for you. This is a cross-reference used by, by Paul. Now, what I'm commanding you today is not difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in the heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea, so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and bring it back and proclaim it to us, so that we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. The answer is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so that you may obey it. So what he is saying is, is, this message, that which brings salvation for you, it's not difficult to attain. It's not far. It's not something you do not know. It's not something that you cannot obey. It's something that's very close to you. Then he goes on in the next verse in Romans 10, and he says, this is the word. And let us read it there. Let me go to Romans quickly. Romans 10. It's not far. It's not difficult. It's right there with you. It is the simple word of salvation, which we have heard, which we have known for years, which we have preached so many times, that is the word that must be in our hearts. We so many times say, what else must we know? What is the deeper thing that we need to know? There's nothing deeper. If this is how simple it is. The word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with a heart one believe unto um, we believe unto justification with a mouth confession is made unto salvation as the scripture says anyone who believes on him will never be put to shame there's no difference between jew and gentile the same lord is lord of all and richly bless all who call upon him for everyone who calls upon the name of the lord shall be saved okay <laughs> That's my message for today. What he is saying is this, and I want to make it practical for us today. In Romans chapter 10, it refers to the Jewish laws and the Jews. And you need to understand that they believed 
that the world had to be governed by their laws. So it was also a political government law system which they had in mind, which we today so easily uh, push out of the way because we say we are not saved by the law of Moses, we are saved by grace. But when it comes to our countries, we simply think that that is something else God has instituted because there is authority and that through those systems we're going to have life. But by doing that, we are falling back into what the Jews did. And we live in turmoil every day of our lives. We're not having life. We are struggling. What God is saying to us is, listen, let us not build up any system of salvation outside of believing that Jesus died, that he rose again. And know that he will even bring salvation to us today in this life through this way. We as outsiders, as citizens of another country, look at the things of this world. We have our involvement. We, but we have our involvement in this um, in a way where we know that our source of life is something else. It is not what we get involved in when we say something or when we vote or when we read the news or whatever. We can have our opinions. We can, we can have our, our say. But it is of, it's of very little importance when it comes to the bearing of peace in our hearts. So here Paul comes and he clearly explains that the Jewish people did not serve God according to knowledge. My people perish because of a lack of knowledge. I'm going to end off with this. That word knowledge is the Hebrew word which basically talks about oneness of flesh between a husband and a wife when they have intercourse, when they become one flesh from where children are produced. The act of procreation, that is what it's talking about. So it says that my people have a lack of knowledge. Here it says the Jews did not serve God according to knowledge. And what is the knowledge? The knowledge is the union, the oneness between God and physical humanity. And we find that union, that oneness of two bodies, the body of God, which is spirit, and the physical body of human becoming one as a husband and a wife become one from where the same kind is produced. That knowing where God knows man and where man knows God. Because of a lack, therefore, of the knowledge of the resurrection and God's creation power to bring forth man in the likeness of God because of a lack of that. That's why things perish. A lack of that. A lack of knowing that. And if we believe that, if we believe that, you know, the other day I, I saw somebody uh, write, somebody from our local town here, write something on Facebook a very, uh, a very political thing that causes a lot of people to be so angry. And it's also written with a, a, a sting in it. And I just said, well, I'm not going to comment anything there. And I see this man lives in our town. And I wrote him uh, in Facebook Messenger. And I invited him to come to my house, to have a meal at my house. But I could hear his story. And here... Where is his heart? And to should I have the opportunity? If I don't have the opportunity, it's just going to pass, pass by. But should there be an opportunity and an open door as he experiences true love from my heart towards him, I want to bring true knowledge, true knowledge, the true knowledge of the resurrected Jesus and how God, brings true life to us, to him. Because that is the only answer. That is the only answer. The only way we can stand in combat, if you want to do that, in the systems of this world, is by bringing the love of God as a fruit of God's love towards us 
and sharing the gospel of grace. man. That's the only way. There's no other way. Well, we've run out of time, and um, I want to encourage you with this word. If you have time in this week, just listen to it again. Just put it on and drive your car to work or just in the back, if you wherever you work, uh, listen to it with your headphones. Even if you just catch a little bit here and there, it will encourage your heart and keep your mind in these things. It will bring that continual peace so that we serve God according to knowledge and not in ignorance. We can be very zealous for God, but not according to knowing the union be between God and flesh in Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Let us pray together. Father, I want to thank you so much for your love and your grace. I want to thank you that you have reached out to humanity and you've given us true hope. And thank you, Lord, that we will not get to a place where we serve you without knowledge, where we are zealous about God according to the law, where we define righteousness according to the law, where we define righteousness according to the systems of this world. But thank you, Lord, that in every answer we bring to any problem, even if it is to our own understanding, will always start and end in seeing the fullness of the Godhead bodily seated at the right hand of God, which is your eternal word and destiny and hope for us, where we see you bringing that forth. And let that be in our lips and our answer to everyone that asks us for the reason why we have the hope we have. I declare everyone that watched this blessed in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen.